Good morning, everyone. Let me just get my stuff set up. I'm ambitiously attempting a presentation with a PowerPoint and a video and a tech demo in it. So um, expect a lot of kind of embarrassed looking pauses. Uh, oh, and, and a friend as well who just showed up and hasn't done any rehearsals. So that's good too. Right. Great. My name is John Ingold. I'm the narrative director of INCL, we, and I'm here to talk to you today about sparkling dialogue, bringing interactive conversations to life, making your characters in your games wonderful and responsive and charming and brilliant and clever and above all, for a briefest moment of time, genuinely alive. Uh, if you've heard of us, and I hope you have, we've done a few games to date. We've been around for about seven years now. Uh, we did Ace Days, we did Steve Jackson's Sorcery series. They were both very text-driven. We're currently working on a mammoth game called Heaven's Vault, which will be out sometime early next year. And I hope that you've heard of and are as excited about as I am, um, but hopefully a bit less tired of, because <laughs> I'm a little bit run down. Uh, we also open source Ink, which is our open source scripting language for writing interactive fiction in. So that's free for everyone to use. The examples today, and this is going to be a talk with lots of examples in, because I think that's important. And I've never seen a talk like that, I think. So hopefully it'll be interesting. I'm going to use Ink because I love it. This isn't a sales pitch, and nothing I'm going to do today is ink specific. You could do it in any language you like, but you'd be mad to because ink's the best. <laughs> um, so, if you don't know us, and if you need a recap, uh, we make games with narrative components to them. So, if you had a spectrum from game to story, uh, where on the end you have stories and on the far side you have games, then we're sort of roughly just the story side of middle, right? So. I can't think why anyone's laughing. Um, so we make games which are about the narrative. The story is the thing that we care about. At the end of the day, we want you to say that was a good story, but we want to fool you into thinking that you're playing enough of a game to feel involved. You're very clever, so the only way we can fool you is by actually making a game, but we make as little game as we possibly can get away with it. And that roughly puts us about there. So our illustrious um, friends at Fail Better, they're slightly more gamey than we are, I think. That would be fair. Um, Telltale Games, as were, were very much more story than us, and as you've seen, I've represented the entire AAA industry with a picture of an angry ferret, somewhat <laughs> more towards the game end, because they definitely compromise their stories for the benefit of their gameplay. I don't think any of that's controversial, but I'm also not interested in arguing any of it, so let's just move on. <laughs> um, so, what I actually want to talk to you today about is specifically conversation. So it's not narrative design, it's not quest design, it's not plot design, it's talking to human beings. And the reason that I think this is worth talking about is one core thing, which I, again, do not think is controversial, uh, which is game conversations are dreadful. They are abysmal. Yes, I like games too. Yes, I play games a lot. But they're really very poor. I wish to demonstrate that to you and show how we can do something about this. And to give you a demonstration, because I think it's important to see a demonstration, a concrete one, I've decided to pick on an obscure little indie game called Assassin's Creed Odyssey, <laughs> made by such a bunch of noobs that they released it two weeks before Red Dead Redemption 2, so it presumably got no coverage whatsoever and you've never heard of it. It's not a bad game. It's quite a good game, actually. It's probably one of the best these guys have made in a while. But here is a conversation. It's near the beginning. I picked it pretty much at random from YouTube. It doesn't really have any spoilers. Let's just play it and see what emerges um, from, from playing it. So. All right. Then do you have the money you owe me? Do I have the money I owe you? Uh, of course, of course. Well, no, not at the moment. Then get it. Instantly, my friend, instantly. But uh, maybe you should do that. There is a merchant in Sami. I'm not very good at these things, as you know. You want me to collect my own debt? It's just waiting for you and Sami, my friend. Who's the merchant? Luris. You know Luris. He's very nice. Luris? Again? Why do you keep lending him money? He's a loyal friend. I don't want his family to starve. You're a good friend, but you're bad with money. Where can I find Zuris? In a shop in Sami overlooking the docks. You know this, Cassandra. Brigitte. You know this, Cassandra. Oh, by the way, also, he's in Sami. I don't know if any of you picked up on that. But... You there? 
You mistake me for the Pythia. I couldn't possibly know. How do you want to handle this one? Not like you handled that olive oil business. That was, uh, that was too much. I got the money. All right, all right, enough. enough. It just goes on and on, and it's not a bad scene. It's beautifully rendered, it's impeccably animated. The rifle's quite good, actually. It's got jokes in it. We like this guy, he's funny. We like her, she's beefy and she's top. But it doesn't go anywhere. It staggers and it stumbles and it keeps on staggering and stumble and it keeps on going. And by the end of the day, what is this scene for, dramatically speaking? Why is it been included? Well, somebody wrote it, somebody liked it, somebody felt that it added something to the core of the story, but it's not doing any work. And that is a shame. That's a real shame, because dialogue is one of the most powerful things we can use as storytellers, because people are intrinsically complex and interesting. And um, to demonstrate that, uh, the easiest way is just to show a contrast with a medium which has got dialogue somewhat more under control. So I'm now going to show you a video of roughly the same length, which is from a film. It's from an obscure film. It's about 40 years old now. You might have heard of it before. Um, it's called Blade Runner. Uh, it's about robots or something. Um, <laughs> Anyway, we'll just we'll watch this and then I'll, I'll kind of draw out what I want to draw out about it. Do you like our owl? It's artificial. Of course it is. Must be expensive. Very. I'm Rachel. Deckard. It seems you feel our work is not a benefit to the public. Replicants are like any other machine. They're either a benefit or a hazard. They're a benefit, it's not my problem. May I ask you a personal question? Sure. Have you ever retired a human by mistake? No. But in your position, that is a risk. Is this to be an empathy test? Capillary dilation of the so-called blush response? Fluctuation of the pupil? Involuntary dilation of the iris? We call it void comp for short. Mr. Deckard, Dr. Eldon Terrell. Demonstrated. I want to see it work. Where's the subject? I want to see it work on a person. I want to see a negative before I provide you with a positive. What's that going to prove? Indulge me. On you? Try her. Okay. So, it's about the same length. It has maybe a quarter as many words in it. And every single word is doing an astonishing amount of work to convey a whole bunch of different things all at the same time. And what I want to do today is show you that although this can be done in a passive medium like film, we can achieve something which I argue is actually roughly as good from a script point of view, if not from an actual sound and texture point of view. Um, I'm sure we can, but that's not my expertise. Uh, just by thinking about it, in the proper order. So to demonstrate that, I would like to do two things. The first thing I would like to do is show you what a game version of this would be like if we approach it in the way that most game versions of scenes are done. For that, I would like to welcome up onto stage my good friend, Sally Beaumont. Here is a, thank you very much. I know, I know, I know. Um, yeah. Uh, Sally is an actress and a voice actress. We're going to do a scene. We haven't rehearsed it. However, beautifully, it's just 11 o'clock, so we're just going to do a quick two minutes of silence from things over and get used to the stage. Right. Thank you, everyone. Okay, so uh, we are going to present Blade Runner, Sally Beaumont, and myself in uh, the game of a scene from a movie that's about as old as I am. Um, and Sally's very kindly offered to cite me the part of the NPCs. Yes. Are you on? Are you on Hello. Hello. Beautiful. <laughs> right. Okay. So, um, so that we can all follow along at home, uh, this is the same script written 
in ink. So I shall play the part of Deckard and I will start with a classic game opening. Hello, I'm Deckard. Hello, Deckard. You're a Blade Runner, aren't you? That means your job is to hunt down replicants and kill them. Sorry, retire them. So we have three choices. I could follow the script of the film and say replicants are like any other machine, but instead I'm going to say a classic, they've given me a choice choice. <laughs> what do you think? I think replicants are the greatest things mankind has ever created. We're like gods now. Did you ever stop to think about the implications of that? <laughs> She's asked me a question, so in true game fashion, I'm going to ignore it. <laughs> Replicants are like any other machine. They're either a benefit or a hazard. If they're a benefit, they're not my problem. Sorry, I thought you were just talking about game development. <laughs> <laughs> this is what happens when you get, have a script with no context in it. Um, right, where am I? I'm not sure. You have to find it. Um, there we are. We're here. We're here. Uh, we could just read the screen. If they're right. a benefit, they're not my problem. I feel much safer now. <laughs> right, and then we move on to the choice, which has a little just arrow to indicate that we're moving forwards. So this is a move, those are obviously loops, this is a moving forwards choice, we've got nothing left. Terrell wanted to see me. Here he comes now. Still you, I'm afraid. Oi. <laughs> <laughs> is this to be an empathy test? Capillary dilation, the so-called blush response, fluctuation of the pupil, involuntary dilation of the iris, can you explain that to me again? <laughs> Make it fast, we're going to run out of time. Certainly. <laughs> it's an empathy test. Capillary dilation, the so-called blush response, fluctuation of the pupil, involuntary dilation of the iris. That's right. <laughs> Mr. Deckard, Dr. Eldon Terrell. Demonstrate it. I want to see it work. You can imagine what's going to happen here. Uh, where's the subject? I want to see it work on a person. I want to see a negative before I provide you with a positive. And then for no reason that I can discern as a player, this one has the little arrow next to it. And I'd really like to get on with it, actually, so I'm going to click that one. On you. I don't know why I'm asking this, but on you? Try her. And there we go. And that's the end of the scene. Thank you very much, Sally. Right. Um, can I go? Uh, no, I'm going to need you again in a bit. Can you okay, cover? Okay. Yep. Is that all right? So, uh, in conclusion... <laughs> I mean, what happened? What went wrong? Well, there was no drama. There was no tension whatsoever. Yeah, okay, I played it for laughs, I admit it. But there wasn't any capacity for drama and tension for some really sound structural reasons. Partly, we added in choices that were pointless, and partly, we kept looping the player. And if one thing kills tension and drama, it's noticing that you're stuck in a loop. There was no pace. Well, we, yeah, we built it out of an obvious loop with little arrows to tell us where to go forward. There was no momentum. It was ultimately completely pointless. I'm not sure what this scene was actually trying to achieve now. Why did I bother including it? Why did I bother rendering it and paying for it? It must have taken ages. I think the filmmakers know the answer to the question. I think me, as a game maker in that moment, did not know the answer to the question. Oh, and ah, subtext. I completely forgot to include any at all, which incidentally is the problem with the Assassin's Creed. Um, scene as well, is that everything that everyone is saying is what they are saying, and they're not saying anything that they're not saying. Um, now, I'm not going to lecture you all about subtext, because obviously you've probably all got English degrees and stuff, um, which I don't, but what I think we can do is I think we can do better. So, I, at this point I have an admission to make. I titled my talk Sparkling Dialogue. That is actually not the title of this talk. I just didn't think you'd come if I called it what I actually want to call it, which is competent dialogue. Yay! How can we make interactive conversations which are just basically fine? That's all we're trying to achieve here. We're going to let's just lower our bar a little bit to something which is just not terrible and see what we can achieve with that. 
Um, so how? Well, okay, what we're going to do is we're going to take that Blade Runner scene and we're going to work on it. So the first thing we should do is we should understand it properly. And that means we should take a step back and answer the first primary question, which is what the hell is the point of this scene? It is not about owls and it is not really about the Voigtkamp empathy test description either, even though that takes the bulk of the actual words. So what happens? Well, she walks in and says, do you like our owl? That's basically, do you like the weather? Um, then she says, I'm Rachel. Then she says, well, it seems you think our work isn't any good. And then she says, can I ask you a personal question? And then Terrell enters and he says, I'd like to see his machine work on a person, right? Those are the beats of the scene, they're the core steps. What's actually happening is, she says, do you like our owl? We have an owl. That means I am unbelievably rich and far more important than you are. To which Deckard says, I don't like it. It's fake and it's artificial. She says, I'm Rachel. She doesn't say, I'm Rachel Tyrell. She doesn't say, I'm Rachel, I run the office management here. She doesn't say, I'm Tyrell's niece. She just says, I'm Rachel. I do not need any further titles because you already know who I am. And how does Deckard reply? Brilliantly, he says, Deckard. He uses even fewer words than she does. What a bastard. It's brilliant. <laughs> So she steps it up. She says, well, it seems you think our work is not of benefit to the public. And he basically says, no, I don't think your work is of benefit to the public. At which point, this volcano of a woman explodes and says, may I ask you a personal question? This is a policeman coming to interview her, and she wants to ask him a personal question. And her question is, have you ever shot someone? This is a straight up, full frontal, for the jugular attack on this man, and he starts to vaguely cave. He doesn't have a good response to that. He just says, no, he can't go into detail. And then what happens? Then Terrell enters with a little monologue about empathy tests, which we listen to, but it's not important. What is important is Rachel, this powerhouse of a woman, this absolute dominator of this scene, the most important person in the room, takes a step back. She stands behind him. She doesn't really say anything else apart from introducing who he is. So because we know that she is the most important person in the room, and she just deferred to this guy who hasn't even said anything interesting, that means implicitly we understand that this guy is absolutely the kingpin of this whole situation. He is super powerful. He is so powerful he does not need to even express his power. And then he tells Deckard what to do. He says, this is exactly what you're going to do. And nothing that Deckard tries to do to deflect him. On you, what's the point? Why are we doing this? None of it works. And Deckard does exactly as he's told. So this scene is very simply an attack. That's what it is. Deckard comes, coming to attack these people, and they show him that they are not going to be attacked by some crummy little policeman, and they crush him. And it's beautiful, because absolutely none of that is in the content of the words. Not any of it. But that's what it is. And it's also a really tropey scene. Every single noir movie ever has got the scene where the private eye goes to the house of the rich person and the wife chats him up for a bit. And then the guy who owns the house comes downstairs. That's in The Big Sleep. It's in Farewell, My Love. It's in all of them. It's just beautifully, beautifully executed. And our version missed all of that. So um, this means there is hope. Right? This means we don't need to give up and go away and say our medium is rubbish and we should be writing more mature things. And my dad is wrong when he says that computer games are a waste of time. He is. <laughs> he is wrong. Because if all of the meaningful interaction is happening in the subtext, then the text itself doesn't matter that much. And that's where we come in, and that's how we do interactivity. We assign the subtext as a fixed structure that we are not going to give up, and in return, we give the player varying text which allows them to feel like they are in the moment, and maybe have a little bit of influence along the way. And this can work, and it will work, and I hope to prove that to you now in the remaining, ooh, 15 minutes or whatever it is. So, we start off, and at this point, I'm really just going to do writing and show you how I do writing. I did this the other week. I sat down with the scene, and I broke it down. I'm going to try and tell you what I did. Obviously, I'm a writer, which means I have no idea what I'm doing all the time. And any time I try to give you a rule, I'm sort of describing something after the fact, not before the fact. So this is not a set of rules that I've invented. This is not my five-point system. It is not a formula. I haven't got it from anywhere else. I've never heard it before. It may not even be true or widely applicable. So please be skeptical, but also be kind, because I am trying to tell you something that I think is really important and interesting. So let's start off. The very first beat of the scene is this. Do you like our owl? It's artificial. Of course it is. Must be very. What's actually happening here? Two characters are circling each other. They are fainting around each other. Nobody's really saying very much at all. Everyone's just trying to size each other up. There's not any major attacks going on. There's no requirement for the scene to barrel forward yet. This is an opening step. 
So to my mind, if we want to make that interactive, what we're talking about is a loop. This is a great place to use a loop because actually throwing the player back to a repeated choice is going to tell them that the two characters haven't really engaged yet. The structure is the content, right? So how am I going to do that? Well, I'm going to do it in ink, which I'm just going to shove a little go back to ops down there. It means literally just loop once. So we're going to run this dialogue twice. I'd like to test that. Sally, can I borrow you again, please? Um, it's probably easiest if I give you this. I've tried to write an interactive script. Normally, so I'll read the bold ones. You give the replies. If I say any of those, we've stopped. OK? Brilliant. You stop. Do you like our owl? It's artificial? Of course it is. Must be expensive. Very. Right, so we've replicated the initial scene, but go again. Do you like our owl? It must be expensive. Very. It's artificial? Of course. That doesn't quite work as well. It's subtle, but it doesn't quite work as well. When they say must be expensive, very, that was actually the point of this whole scene. It was the point where Rachel says, I'm rich. The artificial thing is not where Rachel wants to end this scene. So she will not let that happen. So we're better not let that happen. So let's tweak it. What we're going to do instead is we're going to say two things. Firstly, that not expensive in green, the second box that I've outlined in red, I'm going to say if we've made the comment about being expensive, we're not allowed to make the comment about being artificial second time around the loop. But when we have done that, if we do say it in that order, I'm going to bring in a new choice just to change it up a bit. So that first choice, why make it? It's not a great line of dialogue, but it'll do. Let's run it. Let's see if it's slightly better. Sally? Do you like our owl? It must be expensive. Very. So why make it? Because we could. Okay. It's not brilliant writing. It's not 100% solid, but at least it delivers the point that it's supposed to point. We escalated a bit. We got to her saying, I'm better than you. That was actually what we required. Later, maybe we can go back and find a way of phrasing it that isn't quite so awful. But that's not important right now. Right now, we want the structure. However, we have not run out of problems. The main problem is, right now, we are running out of choices. So if I show you this in the interactive version, here we are, interactive version, piece by piece. Here's our owl. We're up to about draft two, I think. Uh, do you like our owl? Must be expensive. Very. So why make it? That last point, I only had one choice. Uh, one choice isn't a choice. It's just a click to continue. There's nothing elegant about that. So let's write some more stuff so as to achieve some more choices. So what should we do? Right, OK, if I've just said artificial or I've just said expensive, this came from thing, by the way, that means only deliver this as a direct follow-up. It's a really useful little pattern. Um, and I'm just going to say impressive. And Rachel isn't even going to reply. She's just going to move straight on to the next beat of the scene. It doesn't really add anything. It just gives us a few more choices, a, few, a bit more space to play with. We still don't quite have enough. So I'm going to add one other. I'm going to add, I'm not here about your owl. Because to be fair, the player needs a range of expressions. She needs to be able to say, I'm really not interested in this at all, actually. I want to move on. Um, so let's just run that. I think we're up to draft four. So exit. And here we go. The owl. Draft four. OK. Nice. Do you like our owl? It must be expensive. Very. Now, I have three choices. I have why make it, which was my follow-up. I have impressive, because I've said something. And I have I'm not here about your owl. I'm not here about your owl. I'm Rachel. So she continues the scene straight away. So that's just a dismissal of the topic, really. So we're doing all right. We had a few more choices in our scene. Great. OK. Um, that last one was an example of something which I call a trap door. Trap doors are really useful. A trap door is a choice which says, I'm just going to skip you forward here. So we're not really changing the overall structure of the scene at all. We're just saying, let's get on with it. Let's get on with it. Let's get on with it. Um, I think I have an. I'm getting more confused. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Um, so, trap doors move you forward, they push you forward, they push you along, and they're very easy to add in. So I'm going to add one of those. I'm going to add one of those on the first choice. So it says, do you like our owl? No. <laughs> no. 
it's a really valid thing to give the player. It's a really valid thing to give Deckard. It suits the tone of the scene. It just says, you know what? I'm going to accelerate the scene, not you. I'm not going to wait for Rachel to big up me. I'm going to big up her. Fine. And in response, because Rachel is tough, she is going to skip the bit where she tells me what her name is and go straight on the attack because I deserve it. So I'm using that trapdoor to miss an entire beat of our attack because I just escalated it. So let's go down here. Incredibly easy to wire up, but quite effective when you do it. So I think we should probably just run that. Apologies for running the same scene over and over, but I do think it's instructive to see it. So if we go to the L, again, just use the screen if it's the easiest. Sure, sure. Um, final draft. Do you like our owl? So now I have three choices. No, it's artificial, must be expensive. If I say no, she's going to go straight on the attack. If I say it's artificial, we're going to play the scene that's basically the one from the film. If I say it must be expensive, we're going to sign a, find a middle way through it. I haven't actually changed anything about this beat of the film. It's still just the same introduction from the movie, but I've got three choices and they're all valid and they're all kind of interesting to choose in their own right. It's artificial. Sorry, I'm stealing your lines. <laughs> Of course it is. Impressive, must be expensive, I'm not here about your owl. There's a little breadth of expression there that's emerged. I can say, I'm impressed. I can say, yeah, sure, you're rich. Or I can say, enough of this ridiculousness. That's a nice range. Good, we've achieved something. I've had three choices on every beat. Incidentally, three choices is the correct number of choices. Um, <laughs> Reigns can go away. Um, if you have two choices, it's binary and people feel that there's a right one and a wrong one. If you have four choices, it looks like you don't know what you're doing and the scene is lax focus. It's too much for people to process. Three is the correct number. I think this isn't an entirely spurious argument. The people who design option menus for telephones have long since discovered that three is the correct number of choices because it means you can get to the bottom of the structure efficiently without having long menus or without having too many short questions. Mathematically, the answer is E, which is 2.71, but three is the closest we can get. <laughs> I made that joke once five years ago, so it's nice it still works. Um, right, so moving on, what have we done? We first, we noticed that this is a two-beat circling conversation, Thank you. where the two characters are, are fainting around each other. We built a loop because we saw that affordance. Then we aimed to fill it in with a range of player expressions and made it sure that there were three choices because three choices is the correct number, because three choices is the correct number. And we also finally capped it to make sure that the scene could not be more than two beats long so that we maintain our pace and momentum. Whew. That was a lot of work for two lines of dialogue. Well, I've got 10 minutes. Let's get going. Um, so we're going to move onwards. We have Rachel Deckard. Do you think our work is not a benefit to the public? Replicants are like any other machine. It's another two-beat tirade, but it's definitely not a loop. It's got an arc to it. There is a definite escalation. If we did a loop here, it would feel like cheating. We would deflate the scene that we have struggled to inflate. So at this point, we had better write some stuff because we've got a space to write into. So the first thing that's easy to do is add a trap door. That's completely convenient. So I'm Rachel. He says, I'm here to see Tyrell. I'm not interested in you. She obviously doesn't accept that lying down. She says, well, he's a very busy man. But we skip forward. We skip out this business about the work not being a benefit to the public. It's a trap door. It moves us forward. That still leaves us with a space. We have our mystery third choice to make. So we might as well give the player an opportunity for some expression. We might as well take the opportunity to ask a question. Because what Rachel has said, I'm Rachel, doesn't actually need an answer. It doesn't require one. In fact, it's ruder not to give one. So in that sense, it's expressive for him to ask a question. What do you do here, Rachel, is nice because it's sort of an attack and it's sort of a question. It carries two things at the same time. So she says, I'm Tyrell's niece. I'm not totally convinced as a writer that's what our Rachel character would actually say. It's a bit subservient, but it'll do for now. This is an example of the single most useful choice pattern that I'm aware of. Uh, which I've never heard anyone name or, or point out before. And in fact, I hadn't really bottled them in my own head until I came to write this talk. But this is an example of accept, reject, deflect. So she says something. I can either accept it. I can say, OK, you're telling me your name. I'll tell you my name. Or she, you can reject it. She says, I'm Rachel. He says, I don't care about you. Or you can deflect it. You can try and move it on to a different constructive conversation. She says, I'm Rachel. He says, yeah, yeah, yeah. But what do you do here? It's really useful because it gives us a range of player agency. It gives us a range of things the player might want to do. Go with that, fight that, dodge, 
it's a kind of block attack parry, if you like, if this is a sword fighting metaphor. But it doesn't distract us. It doesn't take us off piece. We don't need to stick in a joke so that there's the joke option for people. That's what the deflect option is doing. It's the way out of the confrontation option. But it's not goofy. So we're not breaking the tone of the scene by doing this. So I think this is ridiculously powerful. It's also very easy to do when you don't have any ideas. So the next line, it seems our work is not a benefit to the public. The except line is Deckard giving his little speech about how replicants are like any other machines, which is one of the worst lines in the whole film. It's got a huge number of words in it. It's not very compelling. It's not very descriptive. It's not a good line. There are only two bad lines in Blade Runner, and this is one of them. The other one is when the dude says... Um, we're not machine Sebastian, we're physical uh, to, um, uh, to Sebastian at the end. And then, and then she does like a backflip and she sticks her head, hand in an egg boiler and he says something like, now show him why. And that show him why is a complete duffel. Anyway, I'm getting distracted. Um, so the accept line is that. The reject line is something like, your work's rubbish. That's the attack line. You could make them better. You should make them better. They're not good enough. Something along those lines. And the deflect is, well, why not? What do you think? I mean, it wasn't a good line when we used it before. Maybe we can live with it this time. I don't know. There's a space there. So uh, this is all good, but I think we can do better. Remember that this is an attack. This is an argument. So I can accept it. Fine, we escalate. I can deflect it. That's not going to work. She's not going to let me. I can reject her conversation. I can say, you can make them better. What's Rachel going to do if I reject her? She's going to buff up. She's going to square those shoulder pads even higher and say, no, you are going back to the top of the loop. Because the worst thing you can do to a player is block their progress, even for a moment. And players will feel that. So if you reject her, if you buff against her, she will boot you straight back up and you get the same conversation options again. And you know as a player that your attack, your attempt to fight back did not work. You have been overpowered. Yes, this is me, the author, not Rachel, the character, but that's what writing is. So I don't want to hear that complaint, OK? <laughs> Loops provide slowness. People do see them. Players are totally aware of them when they're inside loops. They have a structural effect. They will slow you down and they will slow the pace down. And if that's what you want, they're incredibly useful, just as trapdoors will speed things up. That's slightly more invisible, but it is visible. So we add, because we need three choices, we add a fourth choice, which only comes in if you get rebuffed around the loop. Actually, at this point, I don't even care what it says. I just need it there to pad out the numbers. He says, is Terrell coming? Fine, it'll do, whatever. I'm also going to tweak the wording on that second line from, and what do you think? So if she says, uh, let me see, the line goes, you can make them better. Our replicants are perfect, more human than human, that's what Terrell says. We go back to the loop, and he says, and what do you think? But what do you think? It's a word tweak. I find that tweaking words after loops keeps things fresh. If you do it too much, people don't realize they're in a loop. If you do it just a bit, people say, oh, thank you, that's nice, you've given me something. Obviously, ink is great for this, dialogue recording is not good for this, um, so, so do what you will. Right, so I would quite like to run beat two very quickly, though we are so packed for time, we're going to do it really fast. Fast. Okay, great, fantastic. Okay, so here we go, piece by piece. Our work is not a benefit, owls, blah, 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 blah. Okay, <laughs> Sally. I'm Rachel. Guys, shout it out, please. Someone in a better. Deckard. It seems you think our work is not of benefit to the public. Oh, sorry. What do you think? It doesn't matter what I think. <laughs> it's a fair criticism. May I ask you a personal question? Not right now, no. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. OK, so we had three choices. We had momentum. We didn't lose anything from the scene. We're doing great. OK, right. May I ask you a personal question? Sure. Have you ever tied a human by mistake? No, but in that position is a risk. Same time, it's the same thing. It's a gentle escalation scene. So what are we going to do? We're going to accept, reject, deflect. <sighs> so our deflect line will be, is this about the owl? Hey, it's some goose. Got a bit of snark in there. 
Reject is, I'm not here to answer your questions. Whoa, that's good, isn't it? You can feel that, can't you? That one is a trap door. It's going to skip out the entire line about being shot. We've rejected her sufficiently well that Terrell is going to enter the room to pick up the scene. Because right now, she's actually got a bit of egg on her face, and we don't want that from a subtext point of view. Also, hey, we made a bit of variation to the speed. That's always nice. A uh, couple of other things. Well, if I do my... Deflect line, is that about the owl? Rachel's not going to stand for that. She's going to bounce us back up to the options and ask us something else. So we have a fill-in choice for that case where he says, my job isn't personal. It's a nice line. My job isn't personal. And she can say, it is for the replicants you retire. Now, that's not a good line either. But at least there's a response. There's an interchange. I said something, she said something, I said something. There's a little bit of uniqueness threading through that particular loop. I've also word tweaked his wonderfully laconic, sure. She says, may I ask you a personal question? He says, sure. It doesn't work on the loop. If you say, may I ask you a personal question? Is it about the owl? It's about you, sure. It's not as good. You go ahead is a better version for that loop. Subtleties. Whew. Terrell comes in. He says, blah, 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 empathy test, blah, blah, blah. You can say, we call it Voicon for short. I don't know why it says for short in the script of Blade Runner, but that's what it says. Um, you can deflect. You're Terrell, Dr. Eldon Terrell. Let's skip ahead. Fine. You can reject. Replicants haven't got any empathy to test. Like, you didn't give them any. You're like your owls. Is that a good speech? I don't know. It's about as good as the replicants or any other kind of machine speech from earlier. But essentially, that beat, not much happens in it. Then we get to the climax. This is the important bit. Terrell's here. He's super powerful. He's the god. He's the don. He's the boss. He's the king. He is going to force us to use the machine on Rachel. And we finally have a new challenge. We've done our reject, reject deflect pattern for a while. But at this point, we cannot allow the player to not put the machine on Rachel. So somehow, we have to make sure that the player runs out of choices in the face of an NPC who is stronger than they are. This is a beautiful scene to write, because on paper, it sounds impossible. We're supposed to be interactive, aren't we? Don't we give Deckard the option just to stand up and walk out and say, I'm not doing anything for you guys, you're all so mean. <laughs> but of course we don't, because we control the situation and we control Tyrell. So we are going to make sure that Tyrell is super aggressive in what he wants. And we do that by making the simplest trick in the world. He is going to ignore the player completely. So I'm going to build this in a slightly different way. Apologies if you're not very familiar with him. There are three choices. They're going to be looped. By default, they get used up every time. So there'll be three choices, two choices, one choice, and then we'd run out of flow. So we really ought to finish by then. After that, Terrell is going to work for a fixed script. He's going to say, first, I want to see it work on a person. He's going to say, second, indulge me. He's going to say, third, try me. He's going to completely ignore what the player says. OK. That sounds suspicious. I can hear the suspicion in the room, so let's try it. Sally? Uh, yes, apologies if Terrell sounds a lot like Rachel. <laughs> you didn't bring the glasses. I, the glasses. I know. The glasses would have, would have changed everything. Well, you turned up anyway. So. Right, draft one. OK. I want to see it work. OK, so obviously we can replicate the film, and I'm not going to do that because what would be the point? So I'm going to say something deliberately out of sequence. On you... I want to see it work on a person. I want to see a negative before I provide you with a positive. Bizarrely, that actually makes sense. Um, where's the subject? Indulge me. That actually makes sense, but only in the context of the fact that Tyrell is not listening to you, which is a perfectly valid thing for the character of Tyrell to do. Mm. My final attempt, what's that going to prove? Try her. Not great. Probably the weakest link we've had so far, but actually shippable, not terrible. The worst thing about that scene is purely that I had three choices, two choices, one choice. That's it. That's the only thing I don't like about it. Dramatically, it does everything I need it to do, which is quite exciting. So what should we do with it? Well, first thing, let's throw in some sanity logic. So sanity logic is logic designed purely to turn off options which look less good. So for example, if I have said... I want to see it work on a person, I'm going to allow the line, what's that going to prove? And I'm not going to allow it in any other context, because it's best in that context. Similarly, the on you line, I said it first off when I played it just now, I think, and that wasn't quite as strong as it could be. It works better if he says, I want to see it work on a person, and then he said, Deckard says, on you, 
that question didn't come from anywhere. So let's make sure it only comes from somewhere. This is just tidying up, really. We're just cutting out a few permutations. Obviously, having done that, we now have a serious choice problem. We have lots of cases where we might even run out of flow completely. So let's write a gobload of choices to stuff up our loop with to make sure the player's always got something to say. And let's throw logic on it so that they appear under good circumstances and then try and just sort of corral everything into a three-choice structure. I know I'm running over. Thank you. Um, so the lines I'm suggesting to add are, if he's just said, I want to see it demonstrated on a person, I'm going to say, I know you're not a replicant, Mr. Terrell. And he'll say, you do, do you? And I'm actually going to deflect that up to the top. That's going to throw him off his script for a beat, because why not? We're allowed to do that. It's nice. I'm going to say, Mr. Terrell, I'm here on business. I'm a serious man. He's going to say, well, either nothing. He's just going to go straight to his script. Or if he's got as far as saying, indulge me, he's going to stress, my work is your business. One of the nice things about ink, one of the nice things about interactivity, is we can say, throw in an extra line if the context supports it. I'm adding some conditions to the next line. I'm adding another line in before. I'm adding quite a bunch of stuff. I didn't do this by magic. I'm not genius. I just played it. And when I saw an opportunity for a line, I wrote it. And I tried to guess what the context was that made that line work. I did that about five or six times to generate this much. So what's the result look like? OK, Sally. If we go back to the main menu, Terrell wants a demonstration. I think this is draft two. I want to see it work. Oh, I have a problem. Where's the subject? I want to see it work on a person. I, I want to see a negative before I provide you with a positive. What's that going to prove? Indulge me. On you? Try her. Now, obviously, that was me running the wrong script. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so let's play the final draft instead, shall we? I will literally just say anything you put in front of me at the moment. Absolute star. <laughs> um, I want to see it work. Right, that's better. I know you're not a replicant, Mr. Terrell. You do, do you? Mr. Terrell, I'm here on business. I want to see it work on a person. I want to see a negative before I provide you with a positive. What's that going to prove? Indulge me. You must have seen it before. Never in the hands of an expert. Try her. OK, saucy last line, but we'll live with it. <laughs> there were choices at every stage. It carried on moving forward. There were definitely segues where he did not listen to me. We built it up level by level by level. I argue that the final result does everything that it needs to do for that scene. You may or may not agree, but I think it's not at all bad. So, where are we at? How are we doing? We're done. We made it. We got through it. Um, scene by scene, what did we do? We wrote a beat map so that we knew exactly what we were trying to achieve with the scene, and we stuck to it. We did not sacrifice it for a goofy joke or for a bit of player agency that we didn't actually need. We bloody well forced it through. But we added trap doors to speed things up. We added loops to slow things down. But we did it for effect, not because we needed to, not because it was useful or because it was good UI. We did it because of the dramatic implications that it gave us. And we liked the way they felt, because we are feeling creatures. We provided a breadth of choice, but we didn't allow ourselves to get distracted. You can never ask them about the windows or say, I love what you did with your shoulder pads. It just doesn't happen. <laughs> And finally, when we got to the ending, we forced it because it should be forced. That's what it's for. So what's left for us to do? Sadly, uh, loads. Um, we have to actually read it, the whole scene. We've never actually read the whole scene. We have to add value absolutely everywhere that we possibly can, because what we have at the moment is going to be fine, but it's not going to be amazing. We have to make it sparkle, which is to say, let's make some sparkling dialogue. Yay! Was very nice. Thank you. And there are loads of ways that we can do this. Now that we have a subtext structure, now that we actually know why we're here and what we're doing and who we are, we actually can add value and make things sparkle. We can rewrite the crappy lines and make them a little bit better. We can do that repeatedly until they're really good. 
We can add highly contextual rejoinders. So in the case where she's just said something, I can say, you don't need the machine to see empathy. And this line only ever appears in a response to one particular line because it works really crackingly well at that point and nowhere else. And you don't know the context of it because you're just reading a tiny snippet of script. But trust me, I put it in, it was good. <laughs> we can insert specific flows in specific cases. So in this case, when he says, I don't like fakes, which is our rewrite of the line that I don't like owls, in the case where we've already talked about artificiality, it is a good thing for Rachel to say, is that what you do to our creations? And jump to the next bit of the story in a different way. It goes to the same options, but it doesn't say, it seems you think our work is not a benefit to the public, because she doesn't need to say that in that time. We can skip that bit in that one case, and it's better. We can adjust minor words for context. So if she said, I am Tyrell's niece, just one line before, then if she says our work is not of benefit to the public, she's repeated the word work, which sucks. So instead, she'll say, what do you do here, Rachel? I work for my uncle. It seems you think our creations are not of benefit to the public. No one is going to notice that you've done that, but if you don't do it, it's going to clunk, so fix it. We can work with callbacks. Callbacks are our manna from heaven. They are why we bother to write interactively. You have to fix your continuity problems. So in our script, it's possible for Deckard to never give his name. So perhaps Rachel shouldn't use it unless he's actually given it to her. Perhaps she knows it anyway. There are also continuity opportunities. So in the case where she's told us that she's Terrell's niece, Deckard might say, I'm not here to answer your questions, whoever's niece you are. Nice little sting, but only makes sense in that particular um, context. Finally, continuity of tone, which is the slipperiest of the fish to tickle out of the water, which is if you are said something impatient, then maybe we can tweak his words to make him a bit more aggressive. Maybe we can tweak the words just so that things flow better. This is nebulous. This is redrafting. It is highly specific, case-sensitive, contextual redrafting, but it does add value, all of which brings me to what I promise is absolutely the final time we will have to listen to anyone doing any talking up here, the final cut of the whole scene with nips and tucks in it. You're going to have to pay off screen, so I couldn't even attempt to write this one down. That's OK. Do you like our owl? People, I need your help. Oh. I heard it's artificial. <laughs> of course it is. <laughs> I like that. I don't like fakes. Is that why you do what you do to our creations? Replicants are dangerous. Replicants are dangerous. <laughs> our replicants are perfect. More human than human. That's what Dr. Terrell says. What do you say? And what do you say? I think what we do here is vital to humanity. May I ask you a personal question? You're so predictable. <laughs> it's about you, about your job. <laughs> Whoever's niece you are, keep up. <laughs> is this to be an empathy test? Capillary dilation, the so-called blush response, fluctuation of the pupil, involuntary dilation of the iris. Replicants have no empathy. <laughs> Just one voice. In Replicants the have no empathy to test. You didn't give them any. They're like owls. Quite so. I want to see your machine work. Where's the subject? Where's the subject? <laughs> I want to see it work on a person. I want to see a negative before I provide you with a positive. Oh, lot of argument there. Sorry, someone shout. Business, thank you for shouting louder. That's how democracy works. <laughs> Indulge me. <laughs> Can I just pause a moment? What have I done here that I haven't done anywhere else in the script? Two choices. Two choices. Why? Because we are at the final beat of the scene. And if you're going to use three choices, because that's the correct number of choices, at the time you want to focus and say we are ending, dropping your number of choices is ridiculously effective. Mm -hmm. So we do. Actually, in Heaven's Vault, all of this stuff we basically automate. The script just chucks out a huge number of choices because limiting it is hard. And then the UI says, we're going to give you the top three of those. Oh, actually, in this condition, boink. And it works really well. So there we go. That's done. We are done. We got through it. Thank you very much. So, um, 
Sorry, I'm actually finished yet. <laughs> I am finished. I am finished. Quick recap. You saw everything we did. I don't think I need to recap it. I'll just show you the points so you can see them. We're feeding in choices. We're using limits. We're using our loops. We have some core values. The player is what's causing the protagonist to speak, unlike the lady in Assassin's Creed who just goes off on one every now and then. Agency, we have to reflect a range of approaches, but it's the range that we give the player, not the range the player wants. That's crucial. They don't know the story we do. Choices should be responsive as at all possible, because that's why people have paid you 15 bucks to play your game. And momentum, time is vital. It must always be moving forward, or at least be seen to be moving forward. Loops are not an acceptable substitute for timing. Thank you very, very much for listening. Three cheers for Sally. And if you want to play the demo or review, they're online now.